you to place your fingers beside your neck, just underneath your chin, and see if you can feel your pulse. Everybody got one? <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> Mary is such a... It's not there. No, Mary, you can try in here, <laughs> on your wrist. I'm joking. And if you still can't find one, we'll dial 911 for you. Okay. <laughs> when you go to the doctors, they take your pulse because it's part of a checkup. And a strong pulse shows a strong health. What if we took our spiritual pulse? What would that look like? Over the next four weeks, we're going to be discussing some methods of checking our spiritual health. And some of you may have already begun to do this by filling out your heart card and bringing it back. Identifying what you love about our church and how you've seen God at work. And today we're also going to listen to what Apostle Paul and how he addressed the subject of spiritual health. Scholars think that this letter from Paul to Timothy began to circulate around Ephesus, or what is now modern day Turkey, in about 60 of the first century. It's written to combat some dissident preaching and teaching from within the developing church. And it describes the qualities of what it's to be like to be Christian, and it sets the standards for Christian behavior. <laughs> Chapter 6, from which we read the end, which Amy read the end of today, talks about a relationship with money. Now, some preachers at that time were teaching that godliness leads to gain. In other words, if you're religious, you're going to prosper. In the 21st century, we call that the prosperity gospel, and some people still try and teach that. Paul, however, asserts, and I'll read from earlier, from chapter 6, verse 6, of course there's great gain in godliness, but in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we can be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, and they are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, for the love of money is at the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Now Paul isn't trying to teach that being rich is wrong, but that striving for wealth, putting money first, loving money above all things can bring sorrow. Instead, he continues on and he urges us to pursue instead righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And he says at the end, for those of you who are present in the present age are rich, don't be haughty or put your hopes in the uncertainty of riches. And we Americans are very rich by global standards. Paul advises that we not rely on our wealth, but put God first, because God has provided all that we enjoy. He urges us who have plenty to do good deeds, to be ready to share, and to be generous, so that we can grab hold of the life that is truly life. Like a physician, Paul first warns against the unhealthy practice and then sets a standard for a healthy life. He tells people how to get there. He says, pursue what is right and faithful and loving. Work towards God's vision for the world. How? By doing good things and sharing what you have. Bishop Schneezy, whose devotionals some of us have been using this week, 
defines generosity as the Christian's unselfish willingness to give in order to make a positive difference for the purposes of Christ. He says it becomes part of our very character and it flows from our heart. Generosity extends beyond the use of money. People can be generous with their time, their teachings, and their love. In our small group discussions, we reflected on how generosity changes everything. Consider this. Last year, over $298 billion was donated in America. It came, three quarters of it came, not from <clears throat> people like Bill Gates, who also did a good job of giving, but from ordinary people like you and me. Our $10, our $100, our $1,000 donations changes the causes that we care about and helps them get their work done. Last week, we took steps to end hunger by walking in the crop walk. The amazing thing is that over 20 years of joining together in this walk, more than $230,000 has been raised to help people who are hungry. But beyond restocking our food banks and addressing that one issue, the cooperation that those churches in North Arundel have enjoyed has spurned other cooperative groups like Bridge and the North County Christian Clergy. And together, those kind of ecumenical councils, they can take on other issues in our community like homelessness and um, underemployment and fair housing and immigration and the DREAM Act. And generosity changes us as individuals too. Paul says we take hold of the life that is truly life. When we give our lives to Christ and invite him to be our Lord, rather than letting money control us, then we allow the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. Our fears fade and our aim shifts from seeking personal pleasure to pleasing God and helping others, loving God and loving our neighbor. We also learned in our Bible study, Guardrails, that greed is impossible to see in a mirror. Because when we look in the mirror at ourselves, we choose to see maybe someone who's just preparing for the what-ifs of tomorrow. Or someone who thinks they need a new dress, a new suit, a new video game, a new car, something to make them equal with the people around them. <coughs> Instead, when we learn that habit of generosity, we think less about ourselves and more about others, and we begin to experience the joy of helping others. Our cart card asks, where have you seen God at work and what do you love about church? We have two people who are going to share their stories. Chip Watkins is going to share his story and then Lauren Hans is going to share her story. Uh, July 10th, 2006 was the day that I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I was watching a Christian programming on television and after it was over, I went to the kitchen to get a drink, came back. As soon as I put the drink down, my knees hit the floor. So all I know is the Holy Spirit got to me that day. And most of it is, is how much I have changed the last six years from not cussing, not drinking, not smoking. And it wasn't all my own. It was all the Holy Spirit. And it's also so nice to be back home here again. I grew up here for the first 27 years of my life. And it has been an awesome ride since. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. 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 Good
luggage to families who have been in fires or disasters. Like, and like some of the luggage is in the luggage is like in the kids, and then it's like stuffed animals, blankets, and all the necessities. Yeah, and all the necessities. And you just went to the Anne Arundel County Firemen's Association, and actually the volunteer chaplains actually really thought a lot of what you did. Yeah. And they actually took a lot, they took your luggage because they thought a really lot about what you were doing. Yeah. And you just got hooked up with the American Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 24 families that were in the Odenton Fire on Sunday night. And oh. the volunteer firemen in Anne Arundel County are really considering a lot of the stations took your luggage because yeah so cuz like so then like cuz families after fires sometimes like they might go to the fire station to see if they can give them anything and i can imagine that the firefighters feel pretty bad when they don't have anything to give to them when like they they need it and Lauren has invited the fire department to come to our fall festival next yeah. week. So Lauren will have a table there. Because it's not about one person giving a lot, it's about everyone giving a lot. There is no age limit to developing a generous heart. And in fact, most of us learn generosity as a child. And so we'd like to thank Lauren for being brave and coming and speaking to us today. You've heard how God changed Chip's life, and you've heard how God is working through Lauren to continue to change not only her family's life, but the life of this church and this community. This is just two of the first stories that we're going to hear throughout the month of October. Over the next few weeks, I will be asking others to share and, and be brave and take that step up and share their story of ministry. The point is that we know what generosity looks like and we see it in people's actions. The hope of taking hold of life that is truly life is twofold. Sharing and do, doing good deeds creates a vibrant, healthy life now, but it also leads to eternal life. Not that we can anyway earn our way into heaven, but by doing good deeds, it changes our heart. It moderates that powerful and sometimes insatiable drive for acquiring things. It becomes a tool that God can use to draw us closer to God and to align us more closely with God's desires for us. In a way, it prepares us for life eternal. So, this morning we've spent some time thinking about generosity and wrestling with it, and we're going to do that through the rest of the month. At the end of October, we're going to celebrate with commitment cards. Cards on which we will offer God one bold step of faith. Now for some, that could be becoming a full member of Belmont. For others, it could be a step into leadership as we get ready for a new leadership year. It could be of taking on a new ministry. Or it could be sharing more deeply your personal resources. I began this morning by asking what it would look like to take your spiritual pulse. Just like we can improve our physical health by exercising, we can also improve our spiritual health, health by exercising or developing new practices. Generosity is a learned habit. So I urge you to make plans to become more generous. I don't know what that's going to look like for you. Maybe you'll decide to become more generous in your prayers. And you'll actually take the bulletin home and open it to that prayer insert and pray intentionally for the people on that list. Or maybe you'll help me maintain that list by giving me a call of people who are in need. Maybe. Maybe your prayers have been reduced to Lord bless this food all men right before you gobble down your dinner. So maybe you want to start a new prayer practice, setting aside some extra time in the day, even five minutes, to pray quietly and intentionally and connect with God. Maybe your plan 
is to be more generous with your presence. So you'll make a commitment to attend and worship with us more regularly. Or come to a Bible study and grow in the discipleship. Or come and help the youth. Really listen to them. Or visit with those people who are too ill and too disabled to make it in to worship with us. Maybe you will plan to be more generous with your gifts. There are many ministries of this church that could be more effective if they had more resources. So listen to the stories over the next few weeks and see if there's a ministry or a mission that you'd like to contribute to. Our trustees have visions for improvements like new doors that you've already seen, a new furnace downstairs that will keep us warm next week, and other things. And if you have the resources, you could make their vision a reality. Maybe you plan to be more generous with your service. Change the World Weekend starts next Saturday. There's going to be an opportunity to bicycle around the airport. We will be opening our doors and welcoming all the whole community into our Apple Festival. And Severin is having an afternoon concert. All of this was sparked by the memory of Leah Sparks, who was part of the Severin congregation. She was a young adult who passed away from a very rare cancer. Rare cancers aren't as rare as you think. They use that term to mean that they don't occur frequently, but half of the people that have cancer have some form of a rare cancer. And so all of the fundraising that we are doing at the bike ride, at the Harvest Festival, and at the concert will be turned over to Cycle for Survival, an organization that specifically funds research for rare cancers. In addition, a few weeks ago I sent home a wish list of service opportunities here in our church. Severin's nursery needs caring adults to look after the tots. Our children need to be taught about Jesus. Our youth need guidance. And worship could be even more deeper and more meaningful if I had more people helping me plan and follow through by carrying it out. These are just a few things that I've mentioned that you could help with in our congregation. But maybe there's another pull on your heart, a ministry <clears throat> beyond the walls of this church. I say go for it. We have been created to be generous. And if we keep taking in and holding back from giving, we become spiritually constipated. We become self-absorbed and money-consumed and joyless. But if we practice generosity and walk in God's grace, we'll deepen our relationship with Christ. Oh, we can hold tight to things, or we can live generously and do what is good and share with others and open our life to the life that is abundant and truly life. Amen. <laughs>